Okay, hi, my name is Robert Brand. I talk about risk management. Uh, if a real estate agent in California is going to be sued, the chances are overwhelming it will be about the disclosure of the condition of the home. So that's my topic. And so today, this morning, we're going to be going over some different disclosure strategies to help you stay out of court. Well, say so many good things. And the other good thing is he can say all of this in an hour instead of, you know, numbing our brains for four hours. Um, so I'm, I'm very, very happy to uh, be able to be associated with Robert Brand and him coming back and giving us the updates. Um, last week I spent the week in... Um, at CLEB in Long Beach, and uh, I, this is going to be refreshing because uh, I don't think they have any meetings there for an hour. So, Robert, uh, why don't you come up here and tell us everything you know? <laughs> One hour. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. Okay. Glad to be back. Um, as you probably know, if you've heard me speak before, this is my, my 31st year, so I've been, been doing it for a while. And uh, I talk about risk management, and that's a very big topic. The niche part that I cover has to do with the disclosure arena or sector. Uh, that's where not all, but very close to all litigation takes place, only in California and nowhere else, uh, against real uh, residential real estate agents. So that's, uh, that's what we're going to talk about. And uh, I'll see it's, we're about 10 after, so we're on a time, time thing here. So let's get going. And I think that uh, you're going to hear from Old Republic Home Warranty uh, after I'm done. They have a, you have a, a raffle, Linda, right? Yeah? You do. Okay. All right. Okay, good. I always like to start out with photos I've taken or found that just strike me as a little odd. So this is kind of a subliminal message. You're working out and you uh, feel like a Big Mac with fries or something afterwards. Uh, you ever seen like decals in the back of a car window? It's like I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what happened to good old dad here, but not uh, too many kids or something. I'm not sure what. Uh, very uh, appropriate sign. I think I don't need a sign there to stop, but uh, I saw that in underground garage somewhere. And there's one more. Old TDS I found, agent wrote down, home is dealing with several issues. I'm thinking <laughs> a couple of therapy sessions or something in the house will be okay. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Um, so here's our, the only statistic I'll share with you, and it's a big one. It's actually a little higher in this market, 85 to 90 percent, getting closer to 90 percent of lawsuits, again, against residential agents, all in California, uh, are about something regarding disclosure of the physical condition of the home. It could be about, like, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, structural settling or soils or mold or drainage or, or whatever. And it's not necessarily that the agents involved in the deal uh, uh, did not disclose something. It, they're just accused of not disclosing it, the, either not disclosing it at all or not disclosing it the correct way. So we'll talk, uh, as time permits, a little bit about terminology and so forth to make it better for us. Um, you will get, if you signed up for the program here, instead of just maybe walking in or something, then, and, and they have your email address, you'll get a set of seminar notes or get your email to, to uh, Ben and he'll get them to you in the next few days or so. Uh, so you don't even have to take notes today. Um, a lot of you know who Gov Hutchison is. He's the gr grand guru with Carr on this topic. He and I do a sizable event once a year somewhere, and I'll share some of the things that I shared with the audience at the last event I did with, with Gov. Uh, let me start out with uh, the visual inspection. And most of you, I'm going to guess, probably use the AVID when you do a visual inspection. Uh, keep in mind that it's not a mandatory, it maybe it's probably mandatory where at the company you work with, but it's not a mandatory form in terms of State of California, Department of Real Estate. They don't care about it at all. It's not their document. However, it is so prolifically used in California for visual inspections and has for a long time that it's essentially developed into the standard of care over time. So it's really good that you use it, but the statutory form continues to be the TDS, or the tedious form, if you want to call it that. And if you notice, um, I don't know if my 
that's too far away. Anyway, we, I have circled there on the on section uh, three and four, section four here, uh, the visual inspection. Kind of, we get our marching orders from the TDS on how to fill out the AVID. And there's only one thing it says to do, and that's uh, visual inspection. So question for us this morning, does that mean that the only things that you should write down on, your, on the AVID are things that you can actually see that are just visually apparent. The, the answer to the question, of course, is no, as you might guess. And that's because that expression, which has been on the form since it came out in the mid-80s, so it's been out a long time, the TDS, uh, really means that expression visual inspection has kind of morphed to mean any sensory perception. So it doesn't make any difference if you can like literally see something that might, concerns you, might concern you. What does matter is if it concerns you, whatever you're, you're checking out there. And more important than that, it's whether or not whatever the, the, the crack in the tile floor, the stain in the ceiling, whatever it might be, uneven floor, whatever, it's whether or not it would make a difference to the buyers and if they would notice it when they move in and if they would be surprised, caught off guard to notice it. Keep in mind that a house can be falling apart as long as the buyers know in advance it's falling apart. It can be an absolute disaster zone. They just need to clearly know that in advance. So let me sh just share with you again for, for a limited time uh, two examples of non-visual aspects of a property that you would still find worthy of disclosure. And as I go through this sort of rapid fire, if you have a, a quick question, raise your hand. If not, uh, I can talk to you afterwards or whatever because I know they have a, a time agenda here. Let's say uh, this is the second floor of a house in the, uh, like a hallway here. I'm, I'm got the avid, I'm in and out of the bedrooms and bathrooms and I'm uh, making notes and so forth. And as I traverse the hallway, I pick up the sense that it's just a little off kilter, just maybe slightly sloped a little bit. I really can, I, I can see it barely, but I, I can feel it barely also. I'm thinking, uh, well, this could be a problem, a, a manifestation of a problem, a red flag of a problem. It could be, uh, by the way, if the home is a few years old, especially like 10 years old or older, it probably doesn't mean anything because it's been there that long and it's, it's still okay. But um, I mean, it could be uh, evidence, a manifestation of a, of a structural issue, a soils issue, a construction defect matter. It could be a lot of things. But I'm already thinking in the wrong direction here because I'm sort of kind of trying to figure out what's going on here. And even if I could figure it out, which I can't, but let's say I could, I wouldn't be writing it down anyway. One of the good things about disclosure, and there are not a lot of great things about it, by the way, but one good thing is that we never need to figure anything out for anybody. All we do is point things out. We, we never state an opinion as to how something got there, why it's there, uh, how bad it is, or whatever. So an example I like to use is, let's say this is a dining room here, and I'm doing my AVID, and I look up, and, and maybe the ceiling is not quite this tall, I don't know, but in the, in the house. But dining room table, I look up, I see what, at first glance, looks like a small water stain. That's what it looks like to me. I think, well, I'm going to write that down, the AVID, uh, but there's a couple problems here. First of all, as I'm sure you know, you never want to use adjectives uh, in disclosure. That, that's a really fundamental thing, really elementary, basic. But, you know, when I started talking about this three decades ago, it was the biggest problem in court with real estate agents. It still is now, it, whether somebody's new in the business or, or I won't say old, seasoned in the business, uh, f been around for a while. Uh, it's still the biggest problem because they're just, it's easy to use adjectives without thinking about it. It's like if you, if the, the sellers had a lot of paintings on their living room wall and they moved out and there's little tiny holes there where they had the uh, pictures hanging <laughs> and you might say there's uh, you know, five nail holes. Well, if you don't see a nail, the nail's an adjective. I was just helping with the case in Santa Monica down in West LA. And uh, they were after an agent for you. They were after the agent for a score footage dilemma, but they wanted to make the agent look bad. And the opposing attorney saw where he had used the expression "nail holes," and spent about an hour and a half with the guy on the word "nail." It was just brutal. It's like, how many nails did you see? So, well, I, I didn't see any. Well, you have nail holes here. I'm just wondering, could the pictures have been suspended by screws and not nails? said, yeah, well, you didn't see those either, did you? So let me get this straight. During the transaction, when you did your visual inspection and you were not under oath like in a courtroom like you are now, uh, you wrote down for your client, the buyer, nail holes. But now that you're in court and you're under oath, you're telling us you never saw any nails. So were you lying then or are you lying now? And he says, well, I said, there's no well. Uh, you got to be lying somewhere. And it was just horrible. 
Doesn't have to, uh, they can do it if you don't use the adjective, by the way, so stay away from adjectives. But anyway, um, small water stain, which is probably what it is. Well, I want to get rid of small because I don't want to argue with an expert witness uh, stainologist or whatever they're called in the enemy camp of the uh, courtroom who will say it's not small. I've written like 10 books on, on stains and it's not a small stain, it's a medium or whatever. So get rid of, there's no upside for me to write that down, so I get rid of small or don't write it down. And I also want, of course, not write down water because water is not only an adjective, it's also a uh, analytical term. Because if it's from water, it has to be from where? A, a roof leak, a plumbing leak, um, AC line dripping. It, uh, an example I've used before, if you've heard me years ago, I might have used it then. Maybe since it's a dining room, somebody had a bottle of champagne, popped the cork, and it sprayed up to the, it's a champagne stain. Or it's something stored in the attic, or there's a rodent infestation. It could be all kinds of things. I don't know what it's from. I don't care what it's from. If I knew, because I have the listing, and I'm close friends with the sellers, and I, I know the story, I still don't write it down, because I really don't know. In court, all they have to ask you is, how do you know? And it's a trap, but they'll ask you. Say, well, I'm personal friends with the sellers. I've known them for 20 years, been in the home many times. And they told me that right there, and they said, oh, oh, they, oh, they told you. you. You didn't see it happen, did you? No, they and then it's, you don't really know. So anyway, I'm not home, so let them know that. Uh, anyway, so uh, I don't want to get into any kind of guesses or, or any um, explanations. So what probably is a small water stain, when I write it down on the Avid with my pen, it's going to be a permanent record, it'll be generic. It'll be like stain, spot, discoloration. Don't worry about the differences between them. They all kind of work pretty good. So we don't have to figure anything out. And then back to the uneven floor. Um, I can't really see the unevenness because it's so slight, but I did notice it, so it's some kind of sensory perception. So I'll, I will write something down. Upstairs hallway fl floor appears to have some unevenness or something like that, but no, nothing about what it might be from and how bad and all that sort of thing. So a non-visual inspection, but it's a sensory perception, uh, non-visual disclosure, but it's a sensory perception driven one. Let's say I've got the buyers. Every time I'm at the property, there's this overwhelming smell in the home, very strong odor, very pervasive. I'm thinking, what in the world is this from? Which is a normal question to ask. But you know, even if I knew the answer, I wouldn't be writing it down. So it doesn't make any difference what it's from. And I don't want to get into litigious terminology like pet odors from the cat, the dog, the canary, whatever. Um, or what if there's like a kind of a musty smell in the room? Maybe they're watering a lot of plants, so it's kind of like built up against the back hill, sort of subterranean. Well, musty, it's an adjective, so I don't want to use it at all anyway. But that's related to mildew, and mildew is related to mold. So it's really a analytical term, not just a flowery adjective to describe something. And I do not want to battle in the, against the enemy camp in the courtroom. They will bring in a, a moldologist, or whatever they're called, and that person has written books on mold, given lectures all over the world, and I am not going to win the argument. If they're kind of a hired gun expert witness, they'll say, you know, uh, I, uh, I've been doing this forever, I've written all these books, I'm the authority on it in the world, or whatever, and I can't walk into a house and pick up a smell and relate it to mold. Now, they probably can, but they'll say that, and say, I, I can't wait to find out how the real estate agent has this amazing ability I've never heard of. And you're thinking, what, what am I going to say when I get on the stand? Well, you don't have to say anything if you don't write it down. So it's an adjective, it's in, and it's worse than that. It, it's a, uh, one that, that indicates some kind of expertise. So you do want to disclose a strong odor in the home because it's what sense of smell. It's a sensory perception. But the question comes up, what do I write down? You know, the house stinks. I'm not going to write that down. I'm not going to do that. So um, something I have in the notes, you may like this. You may come up with something better, which is fine. I like words like obvious or apparent. They're kind of harmless words. Obvious odor noted a property or apparent. I'm calling it to the buyer's attention, ultimately, whichever side of the deal I'm on, to the buyer's attention, which is what my job is. And then they can do with that whatever they want to. But I don't want to repeat something I've heard like it's from the seller's dog, 
when it turns out that the buyer's uh, kids have allergies to cats, and through all kinds of analysis and a big lawsuit, it, the problem is really the previous owner's cat, not the most recent seller's dog. And we're into six-figure lawsuits now because of all the medical stuff. So I don't want to get entangled within that. So any sensory perception doesn't make any difference which one. So the only two things that should be on a, uh, did I see a hand go up back there? No, okay. A defect, uh, the only two things that should be on an avid should be either or and or a defect or a red flag, nothing more than that, or no other categories. So let's just go through this quickly. Uh, a defect is the easy one. That's where um, there's no kind of uh, uncertainty. You don't have to get into the cause. You don't want to get into the cause. But uh, you can just tell that there's something wrong. <laughs> you don't have to be an expert in anything. And you have your pen and you a permanent record, a cracked window, broken window. Now, the reason you don't want to, let me just tell you about a case I saw happen up in um, Santa Rosa about two years ago. There was a, uh, the, the kitchen window was cracked, and the listing agent asked the, the, their client, what happened here? And, and the answer was, well, a, a neighborhood kid had a Frisbee and it hit the window. So the agent wrote that down. Big mistake, but wrote that down. Should have just written down, cracked window, broken window, that's all. But wrote down the cause. And um, so in the deal, there was an agreement made to get the window replaced, so it was replaced. Buyers move in, and then like two weeks later, the window's cracked again. And you know, neighbors are, ever so helpful to come over and start yapping away about all the news. And the neighbors say, oh yeah, that's broken. They, they, they've, different windows break uh, quite frequently here. And uh, really, why? I, I don't know. Uh, I heard it was, uh, I read somewhere, I guess in the, some faint memory, somebody about a Frisbee or something. Well, that may be, I don't know. Well, they replaced it, it broke again, another one broke, and what was happening was the, the home was about eight years old, so it's a little unusual. The beginning stages of a, of a soils settlement issue. And the house was moving a little bit, and it was binding the walls and snapping the windows. So now we have a structural engineering problem, and we have the listing agent on record of saying that window broke because of a Frisbee. The only thing the agent should have said, no matter what the information provided is, is the window's broken, period and then the agent would not have been involved in a very expensive law, or shouldn't have been involved in a very expensive lawsuit. So defects are pretty easy. Uh, the red, red flags are not hard, but they're a little bit more obscure. That's where there's an indication of a problem. You don't know what the problem is, don't need to know, but like, like the example, like in the picture, or my example in the dining room ceiling, it's like uh, something not so great probably happened to cause this, but I don't need to know what it's from. I don't need to know if what it's from has been repaired or there's been an attempted repair. I don't need to know anything about it. I'm just going to write down there's some discoloration or staining or something like that. So that's the red flag. Now here are two traps that, that we can fall into. The first one is the ceiling trap, and there's lots of them. I'll just give you two. Let's say this is the family room maybe not quite this big, and I can't find anything to write down. I can't find anything wrong, anything worthy of disclosure. So I'm, well, I don't want to leave this little section on the avid blank. That looks like I never showed up. So leaving a blank, and, you know, make sure you go with company policy. If, if I say anything in disagreement with company policy, go with, I'm leaving town after this, so go with company policy. So <clears throat> anyway, but, and, you know, having done this for a long time and, and I don't really hear much objection to this, you don't want to leave it blank. It looks like you may be just spaced out on the room or that room doesn't exist, the home doesn't have a family room or whatever. Uh, you don't want, NA isn't so good, not applicable. Like, well, what's not applicable? The room's not applicable. The, what you observed is not applicable. And they have another eight, eight things that they torture you with on the stand. So anyway, I don't know what to write down. And I don't want to compliment the room or the property. That's a mistake that a lot of folks in our business make, and that is they, they can't find anything to say, so they think of something good. And maybe at the end of the avid, because every room looks just great, and they'll have like, this home is in fair condition, like at the end of the avid. Well, the word fair in court means good. It's like if you're going to go on a picnic this coming uh, weekend, you know, Saturday, and you watch the news weather the night before, and they say we're having fair weather tomorrow, 
That means good weather. It means the same thing in, in the litigation world. So I don't want to, compliments are for advertising. They're not for disclosure. Um, another one is normal wear and tear observed. No upside for you to ever write that down. Normal means good in court and there's nothing advantageous for you, lots of downsides for you, but nothing positive that could ever come out of that. There, there's no, no redeeming value to it. It doesn't belong on a disclosure form. But then I notice a ceiling fan. Let's say there's a ceiling fan here. Oh good, I've got something to write down. I can prove I was in the room. I can mention it here. Here's a problem. A ceiling fan is not a defect and it's not a red flag. So it doesn't belong on the form. What it is is inventory. And now that I've started listing inventory in the family room to be consistent, I need to list it in every other room of the property and all the rooms I've been through. Now I have a two-page addendum on top of the Avid with a list of all the stuff that they have in the house, which is not what I want to do. So um, that's the ceiling fan trap. We'll get back to a solution for that in a second. The other major one, and again, there are several, is I call it the spider web trap, uh, literally or figuratively. Again, I can't find anything to say. And I start getting, and there's no ceiling fan, I start getting really picky. And almost like this picture that used to be up here, but the sellers are vacated, and there's a, this little tiny hole. Now, I know I'm not going to call it a nail hole, but there's a little tiny hole. I think, well, I I, I'm going to mention that. I'll just say, you know, mention, refer to it. Well, it's too small. It's too minor. It doesn't even come close to the standard of something that would affect the value or desirability of the property. It's not a material issue in, in the slightest. And I've lowered the bar so far down to have something to say that now I have to be, I've set another pattern here. I've got defects, red flags, inventory with the fan, and now I've got the trivia, the minutia, and I've got to go through every single room, you know, with a magnifying glass to find anything I can put down, and I don't want to do that either. So, unless you have an office policy to the contrary, which I, I, you probably don't, but you know, every company's a little different, uh, nothing noted, nothing observed is a great way to say I was in the room, I didn't forget to go there, I just didn't really see anything worthy of disclosure. So that's a, a, it doesn't have to be exactly worded that way. Nothing noted, nothing observed, those are great things to just document that you were there without straining at a gnat, so to speak, and without coming up with inventory. So you have to be careful about that. Okay, if you're not exactly sure how to describe it or how to disclose it, I should say, but you're, you're on a time limit, you can only be in the house for so long, and you don't want to stand there for 10 minutes trying to figure this out. The thing that's good about this technique is that it doesn't cost anything, so I'm not about to sell you anything here. There's no app to download, it takes, takes a few seconds. So let's say you're in the kitchen and uh, you see a couple of stains like this. Now, if this was in my kitchen, I would think, uh, my, my first thought, just in real life would be, it's probably like mildew or something. I don't want to <laughs> do that in real estate, but that's probably what it is. I'd get, you know, I don't know, Windex or some kind of cleaning product to just wipe it down. I'd never want to do that for a client, by the way, just as a favor. Let me just clean that up for you. Because if when the buyers move in and the, these friendly neighbors come over, nice to meet you, and these are all the problems, and they say, we're getting these, these sort of blackish uh, dots on the walls, and they'll say, oh yeah, the sellers had them all the time. Well, we didn't see any when we were looking at the property. Well, maybe they cleaned them up and then one thing leads to another. There's an investigation, attorneys get involved and they find out that the real estate agent cleaned them up. Now you're charged or can be charged with altering the condition of the property, especially when it comes to something like mold. And there's no upside for you to do that, of course. Cleaning off walls is not within the standard of care of a real estate licensee in California. It may be a nice thing to do, but it's a high liability thing to do. And so just do things obviously that are with, you know, negotiate, help them with a price, help them uh, through the transaction and a zillion things you can do, but just not, not cleaning things up. But anyway, that's what I see and I want to disclose something, but I'm not exactly sure how to phrase it and I don't want to, you know, stand there for 10 minutes. So. Here's the, the technique. It's really low tech. You might be using an actual pen and a piece of paper again. And I write down, exaggerating a bit here to make a point, obviously, two small black mold stains noted. So that's obviously not going to work, but that's what I write down. And then later on, I've left the property. I'm in my car, as long as I pull over, or I'm in my home office or somewhere. I just look at it, and the technique works like this. I want to cross out every single word I can, such that it still makes sense in the English language. 
So I really get rid of adjectives. It's just a real simple thing. I, mean, I don't have to have numbers. I don't, there's no up redeeming value in small. I don't want to use colors, numbers, anything. I certainly don't want to write down mold. All I've got left over in those few seconds is stains noted. Then I get my pen out, and I write that down on the Avid. And uh, it's, I've taken what might have been a liability-prone disclosure statement and turned it into something that's about as liability-free as I can get. So that works very nicely. Uh, I saw this in action at a supermarket. Um, I was at a, well, in San Diego where I live, they, it's Vons up here, it would be Safeway. Um, and in the middle of the day, I was in a hurry like I usually am, and I looked at my cart, I had 12 items. So I thought, well, I qualify for this, I guess. So I put them out on the counter. I noticed there was a guy behind me that was counting them. He was like, <laughs> I was thinking, okay, what's gonna happen here? Probably nothing, and nothing did happen. But a few days later, I was at a different supermarket, and they do something that's just ingenious. <laughs> Everything changes. Ain't nobody counting anything now, because it's the word about. And if that guy was there behind me, and he was counting the items, and I had 18, 18 is about 15. There's no argument. It just takes the, the potential fight out of it. Supermarket is not a big deal. Real estate, it is a big deal. So instead of something like two cracks noted in the living room at North Wall, whatever, three cracks South Wall, there are too many things to be argued about. And I don't want to argue with anybody in court. People don't kind of like the, the about 15 item concept um, where you don't have numbers, you don't have locations. You know, if you have, there are four cracks in the wall or the tile floor or whatever, um, and the buyers move in and they, they call them, I just found crack number five or something. <laughs> it's not good. Or they talk to an attorney and you don't have location. It's not north, it's northeast or whatever. And, and by the way, speaking of, of, before I get off, I mentioned cracks here, uh, especially like in a tile floor or, or it could be a wall, whatever, or ceiling. Um, the most common adjectives, and they're all adjectives that are put before the word crack or cracks, are settling cracks or hairline cracks, those are two big ones. But any word, here's a simple concept, any word that comes before the word crack is a bad word, so just keep that in mind. So. Settling crack, surface crack, cosmetic crack, expansive crack. I've got to say plumbers here somewhere. People wait, wait for that. Five cracks of uh, where they are. Just, it makes our job really easy. If there's like a, uh, there's a living room, fireplace, crack in the wall, it's not like, oh gosh, I got to take pictures of it, draw a diagram, interview the seller, the previous owner. I don't, just crack in the wall. Just leave the adjectives out and it just really reduces our liability in a, in a really big way. And the word sum is a great replacement for five, six, or some kind of a number. It just makes it vague, more vague, vaguer, <laughs> more vague. And so if the seller finds, you know, crack number five, and they're ready to call you because they remember four, and, they, and if they take the time to look at the app, and they go, oh, some cracks observed, and they're probably not going to bug you about it. So that works well. Um, all right, let me go on. Uh, you know, be, before we started here, somebody asked me, two people asked me about death at a property, and I don't have it up here, so let me just sort of add a little bit. Somebody's died at a property, how long do you disclose it for? Three, would you ever go for more than three years? Yeah, something unusual or bizarre or something like that. So just a real quick overview, just kind of a broad-based thing. Uh, uh, for a resident of the property, if somebody's died, uh, from, uh, the, first is, the first category is natural causes which is defined as from no outside source. So that's three years. So if like 95-year-old grandma, whatever, just passes away in the living room, and by the way, it's gotta be within the property lines. It could be the, the backyard, the garage, uh, front yard, somewhere within the property lines. So if somebody's not feeling good, get them on the sidewalk. Yes, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> Let's go, Granny, let's get some fresh air. Come on, move along here. Um, but anyway, it's, it's uh, three years, and that's a California thing, nowhere else. Uh, so that's an easy, easy one to like figure out. The other would be unusual circumstances, and that's obviously not a natural cause. And there's like two subcategories of that. The first would be um, something that's a, a, like an incident, a homicide or whatever, death of a property that's really, really well known, like a celebrity lived there and passed away, or 
big high profile murder scene or something like that? Um, and the answer is really simple for those, and that is you never stop disclosing them. They, they are, are that well known, um, and most communities have them, uh, and they could be nationally known as well. Um, and you just never, whether you're new in the business, been around for a long time, and if you always have it disclosed, and if it's a really high profile issue, then homes that are nearby and on the market could deserve a disclosure as well, because if it's that, that big of a, of a, if it's that well known of a thing and people drive by to look at it, take pictures or whatever, then uh, the, uh, the homes that are nearby, like you, you read about like the, the Brady Bunch house in Los Angeles that, that sold the, the home that was used the, as the exterior for that show. Uh, I'm not old, old enough to have seen it, maybe you have, but um, uh, it was just the guy that, I won't go into the whole story here, but the guy that did the show, producer or whatever, lived a few doors down and he would drive by it every day, and he was thinking of this blended family show, The Brady Bunch. He said, this, this is the kind of house I picture them living in. So they use it as the exterior shot only. Nothing, nothing else, nothing was filmed there. And they did the filming elsewhere. But the, the home's still there. It sold for a lot of money recently. There was a big story about it. But when, that, when homes near that house were sold, it was always a, I mean, there's no number of how many doors away, but certainly like, three or four doors, left, right, across the street, anything sold in that neighborhood, uh, most agents would disclose, by, by the way, there's a lot of people that come for who knows why, and they take pictures of that house. It will affect the quality of life here in some way. It may be good for you, bad, whatever, but it'll affect it. So, you know, when there's a death disclosure and it's high profile, which would be similar to like a stigmatized home like the, that house, it can affect homes that are nearby as well. But that goes on forever. So the last category, we have natural, we have unusual, high profile, that's forever. The last would be unusual but not high profile. Suicide, drug overdose, a long time ago. The only reason you know about it is because when you were like in third grade, that something happened to the person next door and everybody's moved out of the neighborhood, including your family, and literally nobody even knows about it, you know, that, that's living around there. Uh, if, if that's really the case, that nobody would know about it and the buyers would not find out about it, theoretically there's probably not a necessity for a disclosure, but again, neighbors are, talk a lot and if there's any chance the buyers are going to find out, they need to know the only buyers that ever sue are buyers that are surprised or caught off guard again and so we want to let them know. So that's the death disclosure. Yes, sir. No, no, there's no like proactive thing for you to ask, like nice, uh, and I know you're not saying this, beautiful home, I'd love to list it for you. Has anybody died here recently? You wouldn't have, but I know you're not saying that. But no, no, no a duty to, um, you know, check with your attorney and so forth, but you don't have to actually seek it out. It's on the SPQ thing, the seller property questionnaire, so, but that's, you know, th th that's a whole other topic, but uh, yeah, and, yes, sir? Oh, I'm actually going to talk about that just in a second. Yeah. Yes. No, AIDS has no, no, no effect on that. There is, there's a little quirk in the law about uh, if it was an AIDS, nobody dies of AIDS, it's, it's AIDS related. And so, but still, um, the, you have to, ha it, it's a long story, longer than, than we can go into now, but the, the buyers have to ask a question about that particular ailment and then it triggers something and, yeah, yeah, it's a different, but it's not, it, no, it's, if somebody died of a, a disease or something, you don't have to mention what it is. And by the way, the sellers don't either. And so if a buyer says, well, I want to, it means, means, it means something to me for whatever reason. How did, that, how did, your, how did your grandfather or somebody die? Uh, the sellers don't have to tell them. Now, the, the death certificate, you know, they can maybe get a copy of that. And you can, sh you can show evidence that you pursued it to the extent you can. But, you know, if it's a, uh, a lot of inventory in the market, the buyers can say, this means a lot to us for whatever reason. We want to know the cause of death. And if you're not going to tell us, we're not going to buy the home. And, and uh, they could say, well, when it's limited inventory, the seller could say, well, adios, see you later. Next, next, please. It depends a lot on the condition of the market as to how willing the sellers would, are to talk about it or to divulge information. So anyway, when a home is sold as is, meaning 
It's prominent on the, the, the term as is, is prominent on the flyer. Uh, disclosure requirements never change. It makes no difference at all. There's a lot of misconception about that. Everything you see up here except the, the three periods after the, the end of it uh, is verbatim from the RPA. Every parentheses, quote, everything. It basically states that homes in California, unless there's some specific contractual exception that, that's done, which is not the case usually. Every home is sold in its present physical condition, and that means the same thing as as is. So all transactions, all homes are sold as is, whether the wording is there on the flyer or not. And if the wording's on the flyer, it doesn't make any difference anyway, because all homes are sold in, present phys in their present physical condition, and that means the same thing as as is. Now, um, a lot of misconceptions about this. Usually the seller tends to be older. They've been in their, the home for a long time. Uh, they're moving, retiring, doing something, and they say, well, I, they, they have a misunderstanding. They think, if I disclose something, then I have to fix it, and I don't want to fix anything. So we have to just do this little education thing. There are two lists. There are disclosures which are mandatory, not by law, unless it's a life safety thing, but generally not by law. It's um, something that you want to get out there so that you don't get sued, and I don't want to get sued either, so it's to your benefit to write your disclosures. <clears throat> but when you, excuse me, when you disclose something, it doesn't mean that you need to um, have it repaired. <clears throat> excuse me, so that's optional. The repairs, unless life safety, are optional. So we got to just do this little education thing for them. The fact that you disclose something doesn't mean you have to fix it. You got your disclosures, which you got to do to stay out of court and keep me out of court. And then the repairs, do what you want to about them. But there are two different lists. Now, it's usually a problem or it develops into a problem when those words as is are prominently featured as a sign writer or on, on a flyer and they just don't belong on a flyer or anywhere else because all transactions are as is transactions, nothing changes at all. Now, uh, we had a question about, was it railroad tracks? Yeah, okay, <clears throat> here we are. How do you disclose a nearby train or freeway? Let's say, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, train tracks are kind of close. <clears throat> <laughs> or whatever, the golf course is close, or the freeway is close, or something. No matter how close it is, and no matter how many times the prospective buyer and the actual buyer has, they, how, how many times they've been at the property and they've stood on the balcony and you've talked about the train tracks, you need to let them know in a special way and it's, a, it's an easy way that they're there. Never assume that it would be an insult to their intelligence. <clears throat> Long story. So you, you just want to let them know. And that's because they or their attorney will come up with all kinds of reasons why they couldn't quite figure something out. Um, <clears throat> anybody ever have this before where a buyer's moved in and complained about noise from a school or something? Or train tracks? <clears throat> What's that? Right. Right. Or it could be a shopping center or whatever. So there was a case uh, near where I live, it was, well it was in Orange County in, in uh, Laguna, no Santa Ana, where there were um, uh, train tracks kind of near, no, no, excuse me, this is a different one. I'll give you a better one because there's lots of them. It was a cemetery behind the house. It was actually in the inlet, what they call the Inland Empire, like Riverside, Redlands. And a single older buyer coming from the East Coast, retiring, and, and I think he had something up his sleeve here or whatever. But on move-in day, he saw the home one time only, but he was around the house, inside, outside, backyard, front yard. There's a, there was a cemetery directly behind the home. Like if you were in the backyard, it's like 30 acres, it's right there. It's like having forest lawn in your backyard. It's like right there. So on move-in day, again, I think he had something up his sleeve here. So, oh my gosh, there's a cemetery there. I never would have bought this home if I had known that. Well, um, he again had been, only made one visit to the property, but he was in the backyard in the middle of the day, nice day like today. And there were two witnesses in court that could say they saw him in the backyard. So it was a bench trial, meaning no jury, just the judge making the decision. And, but don't forget that the, the, um, uh, uh, the, the way this works is that they come up with these incredible excuses as to how they, why they couldn't figure something out. So of course the attorney has met with this buyer and said, by the way, they're going to ask you in court how did you miss this? 
It's right there. You got a, like a little chain link fence. So we got to come up with something here. You got, you got to have an answer. So they talk about it. By the time they get to court, they're ready. So when the judge asks the question, you know, with all due respect, sir, this is so obvious. How did you not see it? Prepared answer, he said, I left my glasses at home. I could see like 10 feet in front of me. I can't see distances. They were in the movie van or somewhere. And the judge agreed to say, oh, OK, all right. And, and that's what a jury would often say. You think, you've got to be kidding me. But that's what they tend to say these days. So no matter how obvious it is, you have to let them know. So anyway, uh, let's go through an example or two here. Uh, let me talk about a golf course as an example. And um, uh, when I do this like at an association like here, it takes a, an hour or 45 minutes. I'll do this like in three minutes here. So uh, when I ask uh, agents, just randomly, what would be a, a problem with any home that is this close to a golf course? And almost everybody says errant golf balls. And, and it could be a lot of things, but let's just go with errant golf balls. So we start out with a problematic, but just for purposes of illustration, <clears throat> we've been told there, we farm the area, so we just know the area, and we've just heard over and over again, one or two golf balls on average a week hit these homes that are right in the front there. So, so you know, not a good disclosure, but that's what we start with. That's our, our rough draft back to our little technique of, of cleaning these things up. Well, we don't want to have numbers. We don't want to have frequency. There's no upside for us. It, if it's wrong, it's probably wrong. There's just no reason for us to do that. So we clean it up a little bit here and have the word occasionally, which is better. <clears throat> it's kind of a, obs not obscure, but a word that's kind of hard to grab a hold of and so forth. Um, so that's better. We think, you know, you can go nuts on these things too, but why even have it there at all? Uh, just let's get rid of it, and then we don't have to, like, defend it. They'll say in court, you have the word occasionally, you've got 20 minutes to define it. Go. You're in the 20 minutes? What am I going to say? And it's just you don't want to go through that. So we're almost done. Golf balls hit the house. That's better. A lot better. Gone through a couple stages here and, and improved it. But they might be hitting the nice new Mercedes in the driveway, not just the house. So we clean it up just one more time, and we have golf balls hit the property. Now here's the good part about this. The buyers are likely to never sue you about golf balls hitting the property. But now they can sue you over all kinds of things that bother them about being that close to a golf course. So they move in and they say, you know, we just love these golf balls we're getting. It's like an Easter egg hunt every weekend. We get a basket and pluck them out of the garden. It's just great. But you know what drives us crazy that nobody, including you, told us about is that 5 o'clock in the morning, the tractor landscape crew start up their machinery. It's really loud. It's ruining our life. You know, we're retired or whatever. It's ruining our lifestyle. And then once a month, they do this insecticide spray, pesticide spray, uh, fertilizer spraying. And they, they have it on a certain day of the month. But it's last time there was like this toxic cloud of poison drifted through the neighborhood. Our kids got sick. So the next time they do it, every time they do it, we're now moving to a hotel for a few days. And then the sprinklers, the wind blows, and it hits our windows and our upstairs windows. We got to, not as important as the pesticide thing, but we got to hire somebody to clean that off. Now, in real life, you might say, this is a golf course. It's right there. This is what happens. But that's the real world, not, not the courtroom. So here's the key. Not the only key, but a good key to it. Tell them what's there. Don't tell them what might bother them or bother you about what's there. Because if you create a list, starting with the noise from the landscape crew, and then you add in the pesticide and the fertilizer and the sprinklers, you'll never make the list long enough. No disclosure list will ever or can ever be long enough. So don't start the list. Just tell them what is there. And then anything and everything that could bother a buyer about their proximity to whatever is encapsulated, so to speak, into that disclosure. It's just a better way to go. Yes, sir. Yeah, so going back to your earlier example, where you said golf course or golf ball hit the property or
No, I, w I wouldn't mention the golf balls at all. <clears throat> Excuse me, I, you know, I wouldn't mention them at all. Yeah, okay. It's just hard to see, uh, okay. Um, for example, I do a lot of traveling. This looks like a La Quinta hotel on the right. So let's say this home's for sale. Uh, uh, it is not the only way to do it, but a good disclosure would be uh, this home is adjacent to a hotel. I wouldn't get into it. They have 24-hour check-in, check-out. They have drag races on Friday night in the parking lot, uh, beer, barbecue, bash, or whatever, every Saturday. Whatever goes on at a hotel is in the disclosure that there's a hotel there. So don't pick and choose what might bother you because it might not bother the buyers. And again, you cannot make the list long enough, so you don't want to start the list. Just do a kind of a blanket disclosure. What do you think is behind that very high wall? It's a freeway. It's, it's Interstate 5. It's kind of around. It's in LA. It's like Norwalk, Santa Fe Springs around there. So this was a lawsuit. Now, um, my little laser thing's not working, but see the house, it's right up against that wall. It wasn't that house, it was the one directly across the street, same position, I try to keep you know, people anonymous when I take pictures to some degree. So uh, the uh, buyer's agent wrote down for the buyer that there is a high wall next to this property that blocks the freeway noise. Now, what he meant to say, well, that's bad, that's bad. What he meant, at, because obviously the buyers move in and they, they get an attorney, and they said, you said it blocks the freeway noise. And the agent said in court, no, I, I didn't mean it completely eliminates it. It blocks it. it, it mitigates it, it lessens it. And the buyer said, no, when we read, <laughs> it's hard to believe they say this, blocks it, we thought we wouldn't hear it at all. Well, I, you know, I took this picture here, and I, I happen to know that Interstate 5 is there, but if I didn't know, I would know that there's, something there and probably a highway or freeway you could it's very it's loud it's probably not as loud probably with the wall but it's pretty loud and so a way to disclose this issue would not to would be to not mention the walls not on the subject properties uh, uh, property it's not within their property line anyway it doesn't belong to the buyer it doesn't belong to the seller it's I, I would probably just say this home is adjacent to a freeway and then all the things that could bother somebody about that proximity to the freeway, and by the way, don't get caught up in is it close to, is it near to, is it adjacent to, a lot of agents focus on that. Just tell them what's there, if it's going to somehow affect the quality of life, because the noise is only one of them. It can be the exhaust with trains, it can be the diesel fuel, the uh, horn they ring or whatever that thing is, uh, uh, fear of derailment, uh, vibration of the house if you're that close when the trains go by or trucks go by here, so you don't want to start a list. So that's a, a little uh, vignette there on things that are near the home, like let's say there's a house that's two blocks from an elementary school, <clears throat> and, the, and the only way in and out of that school is to go right by the house. Uh, what's the potential problem there? Yeah, gridlock in the morning, in the afternoon, when kids are being dropped off or picked up and you have buyers that say, you know, we don't have kids, we never drove that far down to see this, we know there was a school there, the only way in and, that, in and out of that school is right in front of our house, and my gosh, in the morning we want to go to work, we can't get out of the driveway, or if we can, we, 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 we can't move at all, it's like being on the freeway, and same thing in the afternoon, so there's a school near the house done. And that way, you don't have to get into the, uh, the morning and afternoon your drop-offs and pickups and the Friday night dances and the soccer games and the whatever else they have at schools that might bother somebody. So a tip on that. Yes. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, uh, yeah. Okay, good question. What'd you say? No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, should this, uh, would this, do you want to, maybe, let me change a little bit, depend on the sellers if you have the listing. Well, the sellers, here's the, the key to that question. It could be a barking dog, a, a incessantly barking dog. I think, well, that's got to be disclosed, I, th I guess, or something, or other things you can think of. The way that the section two on the transfer disclosure statement is worded, it's, you know, they have these things that I think they refer, the term literally as neighborhood nuisances. 
Well, that depends on whether the, the sellers think it's a nuisance. Let's say there's a guy that plays his electric guitar late, you know, a couple nights a week and at, at two in the morning. And, you know, the, uh, it'd be a nuisance to you, it'd be a nuisance to me, maybe to you too. Uh, the sellers might say, no, it's like having Paul McCartney in, in the neighborhood or something, and, or Eric Clapton or somebody. It's just beautiful. I love it. Or the, the incessantly barking dog. We used to have a German Shepherd, died a few years ago. They have a German Shepherd. It just reminds fond memories of our dog. And you think, you've got to be kidding me. This would just drive me crazy. But the way that it works with the standard of care and all is if it's not a nuisance to them, they do not have to disclose it. It's up to them. So we, it's good if they do, and we can encourage them to mention things. If you know, we're going, you know, on section two, you never want to fill it out for them. Don't have your, your pen or your writing there anywhere on section two. But advice is really good, and guidance and direction. And if it, you think it's a new, you know, a good question is, is there anything that the neighbors are going to talk to your buyers about once you're off the scene here about problems with the home? And if it's like, oh, we got this dog, but it doesn't really bother us. You might say, well, that may be a nuisance. It probably would be a nuisance to most people. And you may want to, to note that and just kind of move them along in that direction without writing it yourself. So we just have about five more minutes here. Yes, sir, way in the back there. Well, well, you only know about it now because your seller told you about it. You didn't know otherwise? Oh, okay. All right, so you might know because you work the neighborhood or something like that. Yeah, and, and it, uh, there again, what might be a nuisance to somebody, the sellers might say that we've got uh, a nephew that has this condition or some relative and we're very, you know, concerned, compassionate about it and concerned and we, you know, try to engage the guy and give them cookies and milk or do something, we have them in or whatever. Uh, and so they may not perceive it as a nuisance. But if they mention it to you, you're aware of it, encouraging them to, to do so. Now, if the police have been called, that brings it to another level. And that's, a, that's not really a crime what you're talking about. But something I have in the notes is about crime, whether it's a crime, just to divert a little bit here, crimes tend to be in two categories, either a neighborhood trend, like graffiti, drug trafficking, gang activity, where it's just the fabric of the neighborhood. The other category would be unusual, never happened before kinds of incidents, maybe a so-called safe neighborhood. You never want to use the word safe in advertising, by the way. But let's say it is kind of a safe area. And somebody stole a car out of the driveway next door last year, like never happened before. They both need to be disclosed those two conditions, whichever, like graffiti may be an issue of concern or the stolen car. And then the tagline, this is all in the notes, is just a referral to the local law enforcement authority, like uh, the car stolen, don't give dates and specifics or whatever, about a year ago, contact the Sacramento Police Department, whatever Sheriff's Department, for further information if concerned. And I'll have more on the notes about that as well. Um, okay. Uh, oh, let me just close with this. Uh, a, a very simple question, when do you fill out the, the TDS and the AVID? The answer is, is simple, and it may be overly simplistic, but it's very important as soon as possible. And what that means is you, you just always want to have a record of in every transaction you're in that you got out to the property as soon as you possibly could. And there's, there's a a, a argument against that, which I'll, I think I'll eliminate here in a minute very quickly. Let's say the deal comes together, you know, uh, uh, let's say it came, it came together on a Friday. The judges tend to let the, the uh, Saturday and Sunday days go, but it's like, um, uh, why, and you did your visual inspection on, uh, what is that, the 7th on Wednesday. Uh, it's not unusual in court to be asked, why didn't you do it on Monday? It, the deal was put together Friday afternoon. Uh, and a uh, good answer, um, well, they had tenants in the property, could, couldn't do it, okay? Um, and then, uh, then why didn't the dates go 24 hours later? Why didn't you do it on, on Tuesday? Um, 
Turn my guy was tending the property. That's good. Not good are Monday's my spa day, Tuesday I have tennis lessons or something. Just get that out there as soon as you can. Now, some other tips that align with that. Okay, always want to do your AVID before the home inspection, and you never, ever, in my opinion, <laughs> want to follow the home inspector around when you're doing your visual inspection. So I can, you know, two birds with one stone, so to speak, and he's coming out Thursday at 3 o'clock. I'll do my AVID then. Because let's say there, this is the living room, and there's a big painting here. And behind the painting, which you don't see because you don't move paintings out of the way, uh, there's a hole in the wall. It's kind of moist, a little dark, and if you saw it, you'd think, well, this is probably a mold thing, and it's an exterior wall, and it really is a mold problem, and it's a big infestation. It's going to cost $38,000 for the remediation guys to come out with their moon suits on and get all this stuff done, but you have no liability at all because you don't look behind pictures. However, if you're doing this at the same time, you're avid when the home inspector's there, a lot of home inspectors won't look behind paintings and pictures, but some do, and you're just behind the guy and he moves it, well, you're now, now in the liability loop. You think, well, I, I, uh, uh, it, you know, it's going to be on his report. Well, that's fine because he has a different standard of care than you do. So if, if you do your avid as soon as you can, you have the date, the time in, you know, to, from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock in the morning, whatever it is, and it's the weather and, and all the, whatever you're going to put down there, and that's a completed document. It's, it's done. You stayed in your standard of care, and it's a finished document. Now, what the, when the termite guy does this thing, and you find out that there's termites in, termites in the attic, you don't have to go back and change anything in your report because you don't look for wood-destroying organisms, and you're not doing what the home inspector. Everybody does, or the appraiser, everybody does their, their own thing. Now, here's a, an objection I get a lot. And by the way, no peeking is the uh, rule here. Don't look behind pictures, paintings, don't pull up. There could be massive cracks in the tile floor of the living room, but there's a big throw rug, and since you don't pick up the throw rug and look under it, you have no liability for that because you don't, that, that's not accessible to you. Home inspector might pick it up, and you want to be totally done with your AVID document, your TDS, before then, so it's, it's a done, done deal, so to speak, done document. The other thing I was going to mention is, uh, this is the, the primary objection I get. Well, <clears throat> there's a 45-day escrow, and there's been an agreement between the buyer and seller. There are going to be three major repairs done. And I don't want to do it now, because they're going to change the condition of the property, and I'm going to do it later, sometime in the next 45 days. So the question comes up, here's the court question, who's going to pick the day that you do it? And the answer would be, I'm going to. And here's how they can play the game. The opposing side, the enemy camp of the courtroom, will bring in a 30-year general contracting, you know, veteran of the business, uh, maybe a hired gun type, you never know. Get that guy on the stand and say, OK, you got a property. Uh, three major repairs going on over 45 days, and you're going to do some kind of contractor inspection. What's the best day that you would pick in those 45 days? And the answer will be, Oh, I have no idea. I've got to be on site. I've got to be supervising the jobs. Uh, and even then, it could be problematic as to what, so, uh, what day, so I don't know. Oh, you don't know. You've been a contractor for 30, uh, 30 years. You've done a zillion jobs, great reputation. You don't know? I don't know. OK, and that, now the agent has to get up and, and explain how he or she knows the best day. <clears throat> and it's not a position that you want to be in. So just do it as soon as you can. Don't wait, just have a record in your transactions is I always do my visual inspection at my soonest opportunity. And a lot of the repairs that go on are not things that you would be disclosing anyway. They're, you know, up in the attic or they're behind the wall or they're somewhere else. But if there's a significant change in the condition of the property since you were there and you completed your AVID, you can do it with an addendum, an email, whatever your company policy is. So those are some things. So I'm going to end it here and turn it back to Ben, but go ahead. I'll take a question. If there's already a property inspection, the home inspection does require to the inspection, there might be my No, I would never refer to the home inspection in my AVI because that kind of brings the inspection into your, your document, and you're completely independent of that. So, um, and I'll stay after uh, if there are questions. I know we have a time frame. Thank you, everybody, very much. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Linda, could you bring your team up here? And, uh, you know, we can't possibly put these things on 
without having somebody, our, our affiliates, help us out. And, and Linda has graciously agreed to supply the refreshments, the coffee, the fresh food, and, and the snacks. So um, we'd just like her to be able to say something. And she's also got a drawing here. If you did not register, please drop your card in the back to make sure that we can send you a copy of this so you can give it to your friends, fellow realtors, office, whatever. And one of these ladies came all the way from the East Bay today, so we thought we had a big commute. Wow. Yes. Yeah.